بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Let's try that one more time. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله. So today's talk is about establishing a vision so we could attain success. And my dear brothers and sisters, we have this project as part of Sapiens Institute, which is called Lighthouse Mentoring. And Lighthouse Mentoring is based on two key areas. The first area is that we mentor Imams, Mashaikh, parents and Du'at, aspiring Du'at. We mentor them from the perspective of trying to get them to develop a vision and a strategy for success in the Dawah. And the other aspect of the work is dealing with shubuhat, destructive doubts, dealing with new Muslims, dealing with ex-Muslims. And we provide a free service to them, a private one-hour call via Zoom or even face-to-face. -face. Now when we do the mentoring with regards to the du'at and the mashaykh and the parents and the imams and the aspiring du'at, sometimes we get asked, what shall I do? This is the wrong question. What shall you do or what must I do is not the right question. Because if you ask that question, you're going to end up doing things or not having an impact or not having true success. You're going to be moving a lot but not going anywhere. Just like a rocking chair. It moves a lot but where is it going? Nowhere. So what we try and get them to do is to ask, how do I see the world? To have a vision for the world in the future, at some point in the future. I see the world in the future and then you fill in the gaps. And this is so significant because it would dictate who you become and what you need to do to achieve that vision. But before we unpack this, we need to actually discuss what is success. Because if we don't have the correct definition of success, our vision would not be aligned with the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and would not be in, aligned with Islam itself. So we need to first and foremost understand what is success. Well, let's go to the Quran, chapter 3, verse 185. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Every soul will taste death and you will be paid in full only on the day of resurrection. Whoever is kept away from the fire and admitted to the garden will have triumphed. The present world is only an illusory pleasure. So from this verse straight, straight away we get to understand that the greatest triumph, the greatest success is being entered into Jannah and kept away from the Nar, from the hellfire. Is this clear? And usually when Allah says about the people of success, the muflihun, as Imam Al-Qurtubi discusses, that this refers to people of Jannah. So the people of success are actually people of Jannah. Also we understand in the Quran in Surah Mu'minun verse 102, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those whose good deeds weigh heavy will be successful. If your deeds weigh heavy, please note, your deeds are not mentioned here as being counted. They're mentioned as being heavy, which indicates there has to be ikhlas. You're doing them for the sake of Allah. You're doing them to please Allah because you love Allah. You're doing them because you want to prevent yourself from the fire and you want Allah's divine reward. So we're getting an understanding of success here. Success is that you kept away from the fire. Success is that you go to Jannah. Success is that your deeds weigh heavy. Also we understand that success is not having necessarily material blessings. And we have a famous hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the one who's going to be a resident of the hellfire 
and had led a life of ease and plenty amongst the people of the world would be made to dip in the fire once on the day of resurrection and then it would be said to him O oh, son of Adam did you find any comfort did you happen to get any material blessing and he would say by Allah no my lord so we see just from this hadith that the one who received lots of material blessing and ease but he's destined for Jahannam when he's dipped in the fire he'll be asked did you have any ease or blessing any material progress or blessing he would say no I haven't so material progress and ease in the dunya doesn't necessarily mean success is this clear however we also understand in the Quran when you obey Allah and when you obey his messenger you will have a good life so there's a holistic understanding of success here you're free from the hellfire you enter Jannah your deeds are weighed heavy they're weighing heavy which indicates you have ikhlas you're doing it for the sake of Allah and success is not necessarily that you have any material wealth and also success implies that you have a good life one that is pleasing to Allah because obeying Allah will ensure that your life is full of goodness even if you have some form of suffering and test and trial is this clear concerning success so once we understand what success is therefore we should have an akhirah centric mindset when we're building a vision we have to have an Allah centric mindset when we're building a vision for our lives because akhirah centric means I want to see the world in a particular way and I want to try and fulfill that vision and that vision is going to take me to Jannah the highest level of Jannah as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if you're going to ask for Jannah, ask for Firdaus the highest level so it has to be Akhirah centric it has to be Allah centric because we already discussed what success means your deeds weigh heavy and you're free from the fire and you enter Jannah so this means you have to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is this clear? so we need to start to develop a vision so what is a vision? now a vision my dear brothers in academia and in the business world there's lots of discussion but I think the best way to think about a vision is to think about how you see the world in the future how do I see the world in the future? you need to see the world in a particular way in order for you to have a vision that is linked to our true understanding of success so a vision is how you see the world so let me give you an example I see the world this is my vision I see the world convinced of Islam so I'm seeing the world in the future convinced of Islam and once you see the world in a particular way then there's a very important question you need to ask who must I now be in order to achieve that vision so my vision is I see the world convinced of Islam and now who must I be I must be someone who is convinced of Islam and is able to convince others of Islam and is able to lead an organization of brothers that can convince others of Islam and is able to lead an organization that develops other people thousands of people around the world to convince others of Islam this is who I must be once I understand who I must be to achieve my C I need to now ask another question What's, what must I do? the C, the B and the do and the do is the specific actions 
on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, and lifetime perspective that is going to link to my B to achieve my C. So I see the world convinced of Islam. I need to be someone who's convinced of Islam. I need to be able to convince others of is about Islam. I need to be able to lead an organization with brothers that can convince others about Islam and lead an organization to train thousands of people all around the world to be able to convince others of Islam. So what must I do on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly perspective? I have to categorize my life in certain essential categories. Family, ibadah, worship, ilm, knowledge, professional qualifications, secular knowledge, physicality, my physical well-being, my community. And there's other categories of life. And when you categorize your life in this way, then you need to think, what must I do on a daily basis that links to my B that can achieve my C? So for example, let's take one category as an example. Ibadah, worship. In order for me to see the world convinced of Islam, I need to be someone who's convinced of Islam and to be able to convince others of Islam and to lead an organization that can convince others of Islam and to develop others to do so too. So from an Ibadah perspective, how can I link now that, how can I do something that would link to my B to achieve my C? Well, obviously I have to pray five times a day. Obviously, I have to follow the sunnah as much as possible. Obviously, I have to have a spiritual practice in place that would facilitate conviction and facilitate leadership to help others to be convinced. That's why it's necessary that I have to do my athkar, my remembrance of Allah in the morning and the evening as per the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and to make the du'as, the supplication according to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in the morning and the evening because this strengthens the spiritual heart and yaqeen is not just an aqli issue it's a qalbi issue because the qalb has to be sound as Allah says that no one's going to be safe on the day of judgment unless you come to Allah with qalbin salim and the aql the intellect which we think is about conviction but it's not the whole story the intellect the aql is a function of the qalb and the qalb has fitted shahawat and shubahat Destructive doubts and blameworthy desires. The qalb has spiritual diseases like kibr, arrogance, hasad, blameworthy jealousy, ujub, self-amazement, vanity, riya, ostentation, showing off. And these can affect our iman and our level of yaqeen and conviction. And what the du'as and the dhikr do, the afkar do in the morning and the evening, they strengthen the spiritual heart, thereby facilitating conviction. Do you see how that small action is linked to my C and my, my B? Because it will help me become convinced and I need that in order for the world to be convinced, for me to facilitate that. A small action like afkar and du'as. And we could go to other categories of life that we could do the same exercise. Even if it's going to the gym. Anyway, so we have to define success according to Quran and Sunnah. Then have a vision, we see the world in a particular way. And then we have to understand that we have to be something in order to achieve that. And then we have to do things in order to be the person we need to be in order to achieve the see how we see the world. And this is important, my dear brothers and sisters, because there are certain benefits of having a vision. And let me give you nine benefits of having a vision. Number one, it provides focus and direction. Why? Because you know where you're going. Your life is focused. Your family is focused. Number two, it gives you clarity. Why? Because part of what I said is you know who you need to be and what you need to do to achieve your vision. So you got a clear roadmap on how to achieve your vision and live your life. Number three, it gives you life. As Allah says in the Quran, if you respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger, Allah will give you life. Correct? The famous ayah in the Quran. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu stajibu lillahi wa li rasuli idha da'akum lima yuhyikum. Yuhyikum. Allah will give you life. He's not talking to dead people. Imam Bukhari, he notes and he comments on this verse and he says, this is responding to all that is good. And all that is good in Islam is what is pleasing to Allah. Allah-centric, Akhirah-centric. 
Number four, having a vision removes doubt because your vision is based on certainty, it's linked to your aqidah. It's Allah centric, it's akhirah centric. And the student of Ibn Timiyah said that to prevent doubts is to have a vision. Those who have shubahat is because they lack a vision. Number five, it saves time and resources. Why? Because your time and resource now is centered around your vision, centered around your C, it's centered around your B, it's centered around your do. Number six, it shapes your environment. Why? Because you're all about your vision now. Your environment is going to, is going to be shaped now that's aligned with your vision. Number eight, it prioritizes your life. Why? Because your vision is the bigger picture. It's linked to Allah's pleasure. It's linked to the Akhirah. So petty things you're not going to get involved in. If someone slandered you, or some auntie said something, or so some uncle said something, or some sheikh said something about a burger, all, all of these things, you're going to just, you know, you're going, to just, you're going to transcend that because you have a bigger vision. You've got bigger fish to fry, as we say in the UK. You're not going to get involved in these petty matters. Some Mulana said, gave him takfir because he said that pictures were halal, this and the other. This is all irrelevant. You've got a bigger picture. You want to unite the ummah. You want to take the ummah forward. You don't want to deal with petty matters. You're going to de de debate silly squabbles. Even things that are based on valid ikhtilaf. We transcend this. Because we've got bigger fish to fry. We want to see a world that's convinced of Islam. That's my vision. Or another vision. A world that flourishes with divine values. However you want to frame it, we have some, we have big work to do. And number nine, it gives you a framework for decision making. You're able to say no to things and able to say yes to things because you know where you're going in terms of how you want to see the world. You know who you must be and what you must do. And so you'll be able to say no to certain things and yes to certain things. You won't just say, oh, it's just a good action. That's not, that's not the narrative of a visionary. Ah, uh, yeah, it's good, it's halal, I'm going to do it. No, if you have a vision, there's a competition of halals. Some things are more pleasing to Allah than others. Some things are more aligned to your vision than others. So you pick those things that are more aligned to your Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric vision on how you see the world. Is this clear? So this is very important. And we know this because we know the importance of a vision because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had a lofty vision. In the hadith narrated by Ahmed, this is in Musnad Ahmed, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "This matter will certainly reach every place touched by the night and day. Allah will not leave a house or resident, but that Allah will cause this religion to enter it, by which the honourable will be honoured and the disgraced will be disgraced." Allah will honor the honorable with Islam and he will disgrace the disgraceful with unbelief. Look at the vision of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's saying what's going to be happening in the future with the world. Also, we saw this with regards to the battle of the trench. It was confirmed that an nasai and others reported that when the companions were building the trench, they found a rock which was too immense for the spades to break up. So they sought the help of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he, he struck the rock three times and each time he would strike it a bright light would spark and another narration it was like a light in the middle of a dark night and then when he struck the rock he uttered Allahu Akbar the keys of ancient Syria are granted to me I swear by Allah I can see his palaces at the moment on the second strike, he said, Allahu Akbar, Persia is granted to me. I swear by Allah, I can now see the white palace of Medain. On the third strike, he said, Allahu Akbar, I have seen, I have been given the keys of Yemen. I swear by Allah, I can see the gates of Sana, which I am in my place. SubhanAllah. And we know the story of the battle of the trench. Like they thought they were going to lose the battle. And in the lowest of the low, if you like, the Prophet ﷺ had this amazing vision, or he's given this vision that we're going to get Persia and Yemen and so on and so forth. Have a lofty vision, brothers and sisters. Have a lofty vision. Why have a lofty vision? Because remember who Allah is. He is the greatest, Allahu Akbar. 
Have a lofty vision because the Prophet is the best of all human beings. Have a lofty vision because this Ummah is the best Ummah. And let's go back to who Allah is. If you believe in Allah, you affirm His oneness and Tawheed and His greatness. Wallahi, you cannot have a low vision. You have a lofty vision. Because Allah also tells us to have a lofty vision. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that if you just focus on the dunya, then this is like a source of our destruction. And if we have a vision that we want the best in the dunya and the best in the akhirah, then Allah is going to give us success. As Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verses 200 and 201, there are those among mankind who say, our Lord, give us good of this world, and they will have no portion of the hereafter. And there are those who say, our Lord, give us good of the world and the hereafter. So have a vision that you want the best in the dunya and the akhirah. And this is like what Sulaiman alayhi salam his dua to Allah, his supplication to Allah, when he did istighfar, he asked for Allah's forgiveness, then he asked for a kingdom that no one else is going to have. And this is like a vision. It's Allah-centric because he asked for Allah's forgiveness. And, he asked, and it was a lofty vision because he asked for the greatest kingdom. So that's how he saw his world, that I have a kingdom that no one else is going to have. And then his B was that he's going to be a righteous king because it's implied in the dua that I'm not only going to have this great kingdom, I'm going to be a righteous king. And what must he do? Do what righteous kings do. So this C and the B and the do can be derived from the Quran. Not just with Sulaiman alayhi salam, but many other places in the Quran. So we need to have a lofty vision because Allah is greater. Allah is greater. Do not use your own voice against you. Do not allow shaitan to use your own voice against you. Your so-called limitations, or your so-called history, or your so-called past experience, or your so-called limited knowledge. Using those limitations in order to dictate your vision. Don't allow that to happen. Because look at the vision of the Prophet ﷺ, because it was connected to Allah. The Sahaba, and the Muslims, 80 years after the death of Rasulullah wasallam, we were in Pakistan in Multan, and we were in Spain spreading the peace and justice of Islam. Just 80 years after the greatest calamity, because the greatest calamity, ijma'ah, consensus amongst the ulama, was the death of the Prophet wasallam. And just 80 years we were in Multan and Spain. And according to some historical narrations, it was 82 years after the death of the Prophet wasallam that the Muslims decided to fix the masjid of the Prophet wasallam. It was still dripping of water. It showed that their mindset was building people of substance to achieve a vision rather than just building buildings. And they understood who Allah was. He is the greatest. Allahu Akbar. You know, we say sometimes, many times, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no true power apart from the power of Allah. This means that everything that happens in the cosmos is as a result of the irada, the will, and the qudra, the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not as a result of me and my limitations. It's as a result of Allah's power and Allah's will. So everything that happens in the cosmos is as a result of the will and power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't restrict what's going to happen in the cosmos based on your limited past, limited knowledge, limited experience, and your contingency, and all of these limitations that you have. Because things only happen because of the will of Allah. So when you're looking into the future, connect it to Allah, His greatness and His ability. Don't, don't connect it to your limitations, your past experiences and your limited knowledge and your limited ability. Because we see in the vision of the Prophet he it outlived his own life. And that's why you have to have a lofty vision. And the vision should always be greater than the organization and the organization should be always greater than the individual. Because sometimes in our work and our activism and dawah, we think our brand or our organization is the vision. No. 
That's, there's always going to be a conflict of interest. Because if your vision is Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric, wants to please Allah, His optimal pleasure, not just the basic, what is most pleasing to Allah in this context, and it's linked to the Akhirah, the highest station in the Akhirah, then you have to stand in the possibility that giving up your own organization, if it's good for the vision, then you should do it. But who's willing to be in that position? Because it's all about the ego. So my dear brothers and sisters, it's very, very important to have a vision, how you see the world, and you need to ask who you must be in order to achieve that, and then you need to ask what must you do in order to achieve the B, in order to see the world in a particular way. Is this clear? So this is how you develop an Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric vision. So let me just summarize. Number one, we define what success is from the perspective of the Qur'an and Sunnah. And if you remember, the greatest triumph is being free from the hellfire and going into Jannah. And we know, you be successful with your deeds way heavy. They have ikhlas, you're doing it for the sake of Allah. And we also know that material progress is not necessarily a sign of success as we heard from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But we also know that living a good life, if you follow the commands of Allah, is also part of that success. And therefore we need to have a vision for the world, how we see the world in the future, that's linked to this concept of success. That's why it has to be Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric. It has to be centered on Allah's optimal pleasure, and it has to be centered on the highest level in paradise. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you're going to ask for Jannah, ask for Firdaus. So once we understand our definition of success, then what do we talk about? Then we formulate how we see the world in the future. That's linked to the success. Then we ask ourselves the question, who must I be in order to see the world in that particular way? And then we ask the question, what must I do in order to achieve who I must be in order to see the world in that particular way? And we talked about the nine benefits of having a vision. We talked about the lofty vision of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we spoke about how you have to link your vision, not to your contingencies and limitations, but link it to the greatness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And that's the summary of how to develop a vision, what is the true definition of success, how to see the world in a particular way, who you need to be in order to achieve that, and what you need to do in order to achieve who you need to be so you can see them in a particular way and I gave my personal vision as an example of all of that. Is that clear my dear brothers and sisters? Jazakallah khair. May Allah bless every single one of you. May Allah bless every single one of you with a lofty vision and Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric vision so you can be beacons of light for the whole world.